uh, together with uh, emerging technologies that will let us explore uh, new dimensions of data space, and of course, uh, as well, the computational and mathematical tools that are going to let us uh, deal with data and come up with uh, predictive models. What ultimately uh, biology, I think, is going to be able to do is to address many of the most pressing problems of, of humankind, whether it's healthcare or global health or nutrition or the environment or energy or agriculture. In all cases, I think biology is really going to play a central role. And I would argue that central to that are these new approaches, new ways of thinking about biology. So I'm going to tell you two personal aspects uh, in this lecture, and one is kind of the underpinnings for how uh, I came over the last uh, 40 years uh, to think a little bit about systems biology and systems medicine. And it was, I, I grew up at a time where I had the fortune to participate in uh, a series of paradigm changes in biology. When I went to uh, Caltech in 1970, I was interested uh, in devoting half my lab's energy to uh, developing new technologies. And these were technologies that let you explore uh, DNA, uh, protein, uh, space, in a sense. So protein and DNA synthesizers and sequencers, and ultimately the inkjet technology that Agilent has commercialized. This led, the, that is the development of the automated sequencer, led quite naturally uh, to an interest in the Human Genome Project. I went to the first meeting, got involved in the 84-85 timeline, and was an advocate and later participated as, a, uh, as uh, uh, the head of the genome center that took on part of the Human Genome Project. Developing the sequencer made it really clear to me that biology was going to need the infusion of scientists from other disciplines if we were really to develop the technologies we needed to explore new, new areas of, of uh, data space and, 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 and model ways. So with the help of Bill Gates, we created the first cross-disciplinary department, uh, uh, Department of Molecular Biotechnology at the University of Washington. And then finally, in 1970, we developed the uh, Institute for Systems Biology because it became clear, at least at that time, that, that, the, uh, that academic bureaucracy couldn't deal with a lot of the demands that uh, systems biology had at that point in time. And it was these four thrusts that actually led us to what I'm mostly going to talk about today, that is uh, a... Uh, predictive type of medicine. We call it P4 medicine. I'll define that a little bit later. But what was interesting in putting together these paradigm changes were, were really three fundamental points. I think each of these changed or is going to change how we think about biology or medicine. I can tell you in the beginning, each was initially met with uh, enormous skepticism. The Genome Project, I think in 85, probably 90% of the biologists were opposed to the idea. And of course, the, the other thing that was fascinating to me is that every single one of these paradigm changes required, required a new organizational structure for it to be realized. It is very difficult to have paradigm changes in the context of bureaucracies that have been honed by the past and just barely can deal with the, uh, the present. So with that as a context, let me move and talk a little bit about biology as an informational science. And I'll give you just uh, three of the most general features of this particular view. There are fundamentally two types of biological information. There's your digital genome, and there are the environmental signals that impact on that genome. And of course, it's the clash of these two types of information that manifests itself as phenotype, either through development, through physiologic responses, or through the uh, course of disease and so forth. And that's one of the grand challenges, is to translate the collision of those two types of information and how they manifest themselves. And of course, information in living organisms is mediated by, by two general classes of organizational structures, uh, the biological networks, of course, 
capture and transmit and integrate and modulate and finally pass off uh, information to molecular machines. And it's the molecular machines that actually carry out the execution of this information <coughs> with uh, enormous amounts of data points and effective ways. I'd argue that P4 medicine will utterly transform the healthcare industry and force most aspects of the healthcare industry to rewrite their business plans in a major way uh, over the next 10 years or so. And I'm going to argue that it will become effective and inexpensive. If you ask me when the inflection point is going to occur, I can't tell you because that's both a consequence of resources and it's a consequence of society's acceptance of some of these kinds of opportunities. I think the pilot projects are going to play an enormous role in demonstrating the power of P4 medicine. I think rather than going to the FDA and arguing that you can do this, it's much better to prove it and then take it to the FDA. Show them that you can screen from uh, 500 lung patients, uh, 50, and then have an impedance match with a drug that gives you a 95% a cure rate. I think that is the kind of thing that the FDA can respond to. And from the point of view of our own national debate about health care, I'm hoping in the future that we can frame uh, uh, the debate around P4 medicine rather than around uh, medicine, the reactive medicine of the past, which I think has all of the limitations that its, uh, its opponents have uh, pointed out so clearly. So I think for the young people, this is an unbelievable time in science. Uh, there are really no limits into what can be done. And I think the question is just having a clear picture of where and how you'd like to go and do something exciting that's there waiting for you. I've mentioned, uh, I think, most of the people that are present here, so thanks very much. All right, so um, it is a pleasure to be here, and uh, I want to start with uh, congratulations, congratulations uh, on two subjects, and uh, one of the subjects actually affects the, uh, is, is the reason for the title here. And so the two congratulations here. First, Yom Tovledet Sameach. Happy 50th birthday. For 50 years old, you look very young. That's very good. And keep it that way. It's very good. And Mazal Tov to Adayanat. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here in Israel. Um, it has been a while since I have been back here. And the occasion of, of uh, having the honor to speak both at the Academy and to speak in the same session with uh, Dr. Yonat made me think about you know, what it is I do. Um, I don't do structure. Um, and then I thought about it, maybe, maybe I do. So you'll forgive me the, the kind of um, the, the, the connection. I'm going to try to describe what I do in some relation to what is structure. Um, so the sort of things I like working on are very different kinds of molecules. But I put it in this context here, particularly because of that, that you know, one has to use different methods at different scales. You can think amino acids, 200 Daltons, and there's a certain type of method you use to do that. There's you know, proteins like hemoglobin. Uh, it's a certain size and a set of methods. And then, of course, fabulously, the ribosome, 2 million Daltons, give or take. 2 million Daltons, give or take? I'm rounding, maybe 2.5 million Daltons. She's correcting you. I know, but I made it kind of just 2 and a power of 10 for roundness. <laughs> I know, I actually know. And it's not true that hemoglobin is exactly 20,000 Daltons. It's, it's order of magnitude I'll kind of thing. Show correctly, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to get off the ribosome very quickly, as you can imagine. <laughs> it's, you know, crystallography isn't an answer for us. You know, NMR isn't an answer for us. We make maps. We're into maps. Almost everything we do is some form of map. Maps at the beginning are very... Uh, you know, there's Europe here. Uh, 
you know, this is Africa, obviously missing some bits. Um, <laughs> this down here is Frigida. It's not completely wrong, but you know, it's useful. And then as time goes on, you make better maps and better maps, and you really refine where is everything located, etc. In some senses, I think about my own life.